Oldu. Önce kendimi bir tanıtayım. Ben Murat Erder. Yani buradan yıllardır yurt dışında oturuyorum. Ondan konuşmamı İngilizce olarak yapacağım. Çok düşündüm. Yani Türkçe mi yapsam, İngilizce mi yapsam diye ama yazdığımız kitap ve bütün sunum ve bütün malzemeler İngilizce olduğu için hakkını vermek için yani kusura bakmayın ama İngilizce olarak devam edeceğim. Ben Deutsche Bank'ta çalışıyorum. 13 yıldır Deutsche Bank'tayım. Orada bir bölümün People Procurement and Legal dedikleri bir bölümün CTO'su olarak çalışıyorum. Ondan önce de danışmanlık ve aslında kariyerime yani Silicon Valley'de yazılımcı olarak başlamıştım. Ondan Türkiye'ye tekrar gelip sizinle konuşmak çok güzel. Yalnız konuda Java konusunda hiçbir şey duymayacaksınız. Belki Java yani kelimesi bir bu başlıkta geçiyor. Bir de ilk ikinci slaytta bir kere göreceksiniz. Kusura bakmayın o yüzden. So I'll switch to English. So the agenda today is really actually I'll switch back. We wrote two books. Their title was Continuous Architecture. So that's the title of the speech today. And we wrote those books. And I have the first book. We had two co-authors, myself and Pierre Pirer. In the second one, we added a third co-author, a gentleman called Owen Woods. And the objective of the books was really to make the topic of software architecture relevant in today's world, where agile DevOps cloud is so important. And I think we've been successful, hopefully. A few questions to the audience, and I promise I will not ask. If you raise your hand, I won't ask you a question, but how many people would call themselves software architects? So we have about two, three people. How many people think software architects are unnecessary? The same two people, so you can leave the room now. <laughs> okay, it, it's a very contentious topic. Uh, how many people use Agile regularly in their development practices? Almost everyone. Okay, very good. Does anyone, how many people use um, a way of tracking architectural decisions? The topic of ADRs, architectural decision records, are quite popular these days. Anyone? uses what's called ADRs. Okay, okay, good. But that, I think, demonstrates... Um, actually, another question. How many people model their system using any type of notation? It used to be two, three. Does anyone use UML still? There was one. C4? Is that something you've heard of? Okay. So, but the topic of software architecture is, is quite contentious and it's getting, I mean, if you look at the books being published, it's getting more and more popular. And it goes through, you know, different waves as the technology evolves. So what I want to talk about today is very simple. It's based on the second book, more or less. And I'll talk a little about the context, why we wrote the book. I've covered some of that already. I'll talk about we have six core principles in the book. And then we have a case study. I'll cover the case study. And then we'll, I'll wrap up with back to essentials. What do we mean by software arch architecture? You know, why is it important and what you should do? A difficult slide to see, apologize. And this is the only place where you see Java in my presentation, and that's 1995. Right, that's why Java 1.0 was um, developed. But what I'm trying to show here is it's actually, it, it's, you know, it's a good way to think about how technology evolves. And it's not the prettiest of pictures, apologies. But up above the line is how technology evolved throughout, I guess, the decades. And down below is the topics around um, what you might call architecture or development approaches. And I'm not going to read through the slide, but what's interesting is, first of all, certain concepts, you know, like structuring your software have been around for a very long time. You know, you have the concept of structured programming in 1966. The OSI layer, how, does, how many people know what the OSI layer is? If you go to, any, yeah, I went to Otto, and in electrical engineering, that was one of the first things we were taught many years ago. But that was, it's just a, it's one of the first layered architectures. 
you know, that has evolved in the industry, and it's actually incredibly powerful. If you talk to anyone who would call themselves a network engineer, or a, you know, how, you know, or an infrastructure person, as we call them, they all talk about the OSI layer. You know, you say about this, blah blah blah, and you say whatever layer it is, and they say layer four, and it's it's actually. I would say it's the foundation of the internet being so successful, and it's just a very simple model of a layered architecture. But if you look at it, the 90s was an interesting period in the, you know, that, well, that's because Java came out, I guess that was one great uh, accomplishment. But it was object-oriented analysis and design, a different way of, of doing technology. And there was a bunch of things which we call the concept of use cases, there was the UML, design patterns, etc. The, the huge plethora of approaches to software architecture and how you should construct it were done. But that was before Agile came into the picture, right? And you can see Agile is about, comes to the picture about the same time as what you might call the cloud, uh, you know, I guess the 2000s plus thing come out. And since then, there's been kind of a huge debate because, I mean, Agile, the manifesto itself is quite powerful with its, I think, five core, uh, you know, principles. But it, it created this tension uh, of what you might call, traditionally, there was this approach of architecture being, I guess, two ways of thinking about it. One is you have, you have to architect it first. You have to draw your pictures, decide what the big components are, uh, etc. That was just more of a, you know, development approach concept. But the second thing that, that happened is this concept, and especially, actually another question, how many people here work in what you might call a large enterprise? I don't know. If, okay, so that's about one fourth of the audience. Because especially I work in a large enterprise, and what happens is that in those type of institutions, the role of what you might call an architect becomes almost separate than the developers. And it, it creates a lot of weird tension because the architects are the people who approve things, right? They, they have the power. They, they know what's good, what's bad. And they come once in a while and they review what the developers are doing. And then they might say, you're doing it wrong. The developers really don't have any respect to the architects, they say, who, who, who are these idiots that don't even write code telling us what to do? And you know, when they have to do architecture reviews, they try to do the minimal possible just to get away from it, right? So it, it creates a very, uh, you know, so both from the way you approach it, which is waterfall versus agile, but also culturally in organizations, the topic of software architectures is quite, um, I guess there's a lot of tension there. And then, I mean, we just said continuous architecture. Now, we came up to our first book we wrote five years ago. And that first book was very, it's about concepts, ideas. So if you're not a software architect, you probably wouldn't find that book very interesting, right? So it was, I guess, successful, uh, but uh, I guess had a limited audience. The second book we wrote, which is continuous architecture in practice, was really focused on I guess reaching out more to the developer engineering community, trying to get uh, you know our ideas across, and it's based around a case study, and I'll talk more about that in this speech. But anyway, so I, this is an interesting way of thinking about things. There's this thing called TOGAF down below. I don't know, has anyone heard of TOGAF in the audience? It's, yeah, it's I don't, I'm not a big fan of it, but it's a big. You know, it, it has, it, it smells like this big central architecture and, and big things, but it's quite popular and lots of people go get their certification. It's almost like having your GCP certification or AWS thing. If you want to call yourself an architect, getting a TOGAF certification is quite important. Another interesting thing I'll just talk about very quickly is kind of, it's independent of architecture, but this is something we noticed of how the technology world is evolving, right? First you had basically, we said we needed to develop faster. You know, this way of delivering software was not good. So Agile came up. And Agile, I mean, I think very few people go back to the core principles. There's lots of things like, you know, save, scrum, etc. lots of debates. 
But what we realized is, wait a second, you know, and this is just very high level. We said, wait a second, if we want to develop Quacker, but infrastructure is a bottleneck, right? We can't get our infrastructure. So that's when cloud came to the picture. Then we have, okay, infrastructure. Now we don't have to wait two months to get a server. We can get it on cloud. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. Deployment is difficult. I still, this takes a lot of time. I have to go through a lot of hurdles to get thing on there. So deployment automation came into the picture. But then we had this big thing of then you hit into these cultural walls of, uh, you know, teams being able to manage the change, and that's how DevOps, you know, came. So I, I like that little story. It was actually one of the co-authors that came up with that, so I thought I'll share that with you. I listened to one speech yesterday, which is um, by, I think, Shai. It was from Light Run. It was the afternoon session. And one thing he put on that slide, which is very interesting to me, that he had the developers and the DevOps as two separate teams, which in my mind is, you know, totally contrary to how DevOps should operate. But that has what has happened. Like, you know, if you go to large enterprises like ours, you know, people just said they used to be the operations team and they just erased it and they wrote DevOps. Now they're the DevOps team and everyone's happy. But I don't think we've solved all our problems. Anyway, enough on the context. So, I'll spend very little time on this slide, but our goals of continuous architecture and a horrible 1990s diagram, so I apologize for that. But if you say, and another thing we have is whenever you talk about software architecture, people like to uh, compare it to buildings. And we think that's totally wrong, right? I mean, software, you, you don't... Because when you build this hotel, you don't suddenly decide that you need to, you know, add a conference hall later words and then, oh, I forgot a restaurant, let me add a restaurant and uh, parking lots, let's now dig and do parking lots. You, you know, buildings are much more, I guess, they stay, you know, they, they don't change that often while software continuously changes. So that, I, I, so we still think the building metaphor is wrong. However, we've still used the built-in metaphor, so I apologize for that. But th the main thing we're trying to say is that if you, if you look at the industry, what people say is that if you want to build a cathedral, the developer or the agile developer say, where's the shovel, right? Let me just start digging. And the traditional architect will say, where's the five-year plan? And that's the tension, right? That's what we're really trying to resolve is how can we, because we believe architecture is important. And actually, I haven't defined what software architecture is, like, and I'm not going to. <laughs> but it is very important because every system has an architecture, if you like it or not, if you define it or not. And the whole reason you need an architecture is you're building a software product, and you want to make sure that's sustainable over time. You, you want to make sure that you know, it won't fall over because of non-functional requirements, you know, scalability issues, or... Um, you know, not being able to deploy features quickly because you're always dealing with your technical debt. So the whole reason of having an architecture is to make sure that your software product is sustainable over time. You know, you could say that the level of effort, you know, some of these principles might not apply that much if you're just writing software that goes into the, you know, a space probe that gets launched and never gets its software updated. Though I've heard nowadays you do even update the software of, of space probes. But software is continuously evolving, and that's important to take into the picture. So I'll talk about the principles, right? And we're saying software can um, you know, evolve continuously if the first principle, and we, I try to be cute with the graphics here, is, and they're very simple things, but it's architect products, not solutions for projects. And this, how many people here, when they work, they work with a product manager? That's someone that tells you, here's what my clients want, prioritizes the backlog, et cetera, so that one. But it, it's, it's quite important, right, that, and it seems obvious, and more obvious now than when we first put it out, but a lot of times, especially in large enterprises, you architect around projects. You get funding for a project, and you think about how I should construct that software for that project. 
A good example is in banking. We have lots of regulations, so you get a Basel II or MIFID regulations, and then we have done that, and all lots of banks have done that issue. It's um, you just try to build a system that solves that problem, right? And you, you're successful in solving that problem, but that's it, right? Then you build another system and another one, another one, and before you know it, everything's a mess, right? So trying to think about the, your software as, arc, as products is quite important. For certain people who are just in software companies or startups, that's actually quite natural. The second thing is we want to say that you know, when you're architecting, focus on quality attributes, which is another word for non-functional requirements. So you see the names there, discoverability, performance, you know, whatever you want. To. Because our premise is that that's what makes or breaks your system, right? It's the quality attributes. If you can do, you know, if you can't scale up to meet your requirements, if your performance is unsatisfactory, those are the key issues you want to focus on. The challenge is, most people, when we, even myself included, when you think about architect in a system, you don't think about this that much. You focus more on the functional components, or at least most people do. And even if you think about these, you don't write enough test cases, you know, you don't manage your, you know, the way you would be able to test your architecture, test your system based on the quality attributes. And actually, before cloud, that was quite difficult. You know, with the cloud, hopefully, that's, that's much easier to do these days. There's a, something called, uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, uh, SEI, the Software Engineering Institute in Carnegie Mellon, has developed uh, something they call the a ATAM, and they have something in that that's called the Quality Attribute Tree, which is just a nice way of yeah, I mean, this is just a mind map, but if you go into the detail, they have a good technique of how you might want to document uh, quality attributes. Our third principle is, and this is an agile principle, is delay design decisions until they are absolutely necessary. Now, this is a quite a contentious topic, because what this means is, you don't have to make all your decisions today. You don't have to decide certain decisions you have to make today, but you, you, you don't need to make all your decisions today. You, you d make your decisions based on facts. I mean, there are quite good examples. People say, oh, we need a configurable system, so let's have a rules engine inside that system. But there's no proof that you do need a rules engine, or you don't even know what your configuration requirements are. So why put a rules engine into that system? You know, I have had examples of people saying, we need a highly scalable, you know, web server, so we're going to bring in this technology. And they brought it in and they implemented and you know, none of the requirements happened, right? They didn't get that number of users they wanted, so they had brought in a technology that was not required at all. So, you know, make your decisions based on the facts you know today. Um, the little picture there is actually from my years ago from my master's thesis, which was uh, on image processing. And there, there's a concept called simulated annealing. And annealing is the process of cooling down steel, right? Well, when you make steel, it becomes this it's very hot thing and you cool it down. And there's a way of you manage the temperature. You slowly, if you cool the steel down too quickly, it breaks, right? You don't have, uh, you know, you just have broken metal. Simulated annealing is a way of simulating that. So when you're trying to process an image, and this is a little segue, sorry for that, but when you process an image that's noisy, you try to, you, the way you go through that image, you go to each pixel and you look at its neighboring pixels and then you make a decision. If it's a black and white image, you know, should my, based on my neighbors, if I have eight white neighbors, I should be white. You know, if I have, you know, four black ones, it's 50-50. So if you did that deterministically, you would not clean up the image at all. What simulating annealing does is it allows you to make mistakes. So you initially you allow it to go up and down and you actually, you know, based on some probability calculations, a pixel is decided, you know, it can flip to something that's not, you know, sensical. 
And then you close slowly, make it, you know, you go over the image thousands of times, you make it slowly more deterministic. Now, what was interesting about that is that if you m cooled it down, cooled the image down quickly, it would break, just like steel breaks. And my, you know, and whenever I see this, in the, and I think if you make, try to force too many decisions and try to construct your software too early on, your software will break. You know, that's how, so I always go to that image. I know it's a little far-fetched, but I have seen people make lots of decisions very quickly based on, not based on facts, based on how they feel about it, and then they end up with broken software. So delay design decisions until they are absolutely necessary. I mean, this is an obvious one. Architect for change, lever the, leverage the power of small I think, I mean, the term microservices, how many people claim they build microservices architecture? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you go to um, my organization, every, everyone claims they do microservices now, right? To, to say you don't is like, it's, it's embarrassing, right? So, but it is, it is quite important. Uh, on my, and, but the view about microservices is not, I think the term micro has, caused a lot of issues because micro means it has to be very small and that's what people say that you know the thing i develop has to be incredibly small i have this you know a, a small you know component a few classes etc cetera, etc cetera, and i have a microservice but what you should think about is what's going to change you know the whole idea is you want to isolate you know parts of your software that's going to change from parts of your software that are not going to change right that's important so you know, my view at least is microservices doesn't mean, you know, I had one system, now I have, you know, 10 components by more microservices. It's really around what's going to change. But it's a very powerful principle. The other interesting one is um, what we say architect for build, test, and in the first book, we stopped at deploy, and now we added operate to keep up with the market trends. Uh, but it's, it's really important, because when you architect a system, traditionally, if you were called yourself a software architect, you would architect, you would draw a few diagrams. In the more traditional model, you would say, we have these six or seven components, and this is it. We have a database here, that there. And then you hand it over to the the, the development teams and you know good luck and I'll come back for an architecture review six months later. The premises, I guess, one of our core premises, those type of architects shouldn't exist. But even if they did, when you architect a system, you should think about not only how it's going to run in production, but you, how how are you going to deploy it? How are you going to test it? How are you going to operate it? That's more that's as important as just architecting the system itself. And uh, again, yesterday's talk about Lightrun was quite, I enjoyed it, and it was very interesting about observability. You know, how do you observe, you know, your, uh, your software? And that's quite important because feedback loops, which I'll talk about later, are, are quite critical in being able to understand your software. So that's our principle five. And our last principle, which is, the most difficult principle to explain, and, and sometimes I wonder why we did it, is model the organization after the design of the system. Um, ha, have people heard of this Conway's law? I have one back there. One. Yeah, and this is someone called Conway. I think he wrote it in the 70s or 60s. He wrote a book or a, or a paper, and it wasn't actually based on software. It was based on systems. And it said, any system that you build reflects the communication structures of the organization that builds that system. So they've tested this out. I mean, they basically, this is, I think, in the 80s, they did a test where they took, uh, they, to build a compiler, they had two, one, you know, they had two groups, or, yeah, to build the same compiler, they got the same requirements, but they told, Group A, you have to have two teams, and group B, you have to have three teams. So the compiler that group A built had two components, and the, the you know, group B built had three components. So basically, and they both worked, right? And it is a proof that basically how you structure your organization has quite a big impact on your architecture of the system you're building. Um, 
but that's not the only thing we're saying here. I mean, there's a, but that's a very interesting to think about again culturally how the software get developed in organizations and enterprises. But the other thing is obviously the whole concept of having unified teams. You know, you don't have separate DBAs, you don't have separate testers. You know, that's the key thing. Everyone works around, you know, a pod, you know, a feature team, whatever you call it, right? And sorry, I keep on asking questions to you guys, but how many people work in a, what you might call a, a cohesive feature team where the testers, the DBAs, you know, uh, et cetera, developers are one team? So that's about, you know, one eighth. Because the whole idea is that that is much more effective. I mean, that is, if people ask me what Agile is, Agile says it's the team. It's power to the team. It's, it's nothing else. That's the most important thing. Well, obviously, it's the principles, but that's incredibly important in Agile is that you have to have, the team has to have the knowledge, the skills to build the software that they have to do, and they shouldn't depend on anyone else, and they should be able to successful, be successful on their own. So that's principle six, really. So there's the macro reading of principle six, which is more around um, you know, the Conway's law and of more philosophical thing, but then there's the more micro reading, or micro, or just the more actually practical reading, which is really you know, create self-sufficient teams. So I'll go to the case study. So that was the principles, and I'm not gonna try to describe this at all, but I, I thought, you know, and it's, the principles are very nice and they're very, I think they're very valid, but, you know, trying to show, well, what does that mean? You know, if I tried to build the system, what would that mean? So what we did is we took an example and we, in books, if you look at most books, at least that talk about software architecture, almost all examples are web shopping systems, right? You're buying an online widget and you're selling a widget and all that type of stuff. And that's, so we said, let's pick something else, right? And we picked trade finance. You don't really have to understand it that much and I don't have time to do that because one of our authors, I mean, first of all, the three of us work in financial services and one of them had worked in trade finance system. So we just randomly picked it and we pretended we're building a trade finance application on AWS. And all we did was, what are the architectural decisions we need to make for that? Well, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the case study. I mean, trade finance is very simple. You have buyers and sellers. So there's a buyer who's an importer, sellers and exporter in separate countries, lots of the times. And it's a very complicated process of how, you know, money moves and, and and to make sure that the uh, you know, buyer can get his goods and only pays his money when he gets the goods and that the seller obviously can get funding and is not waiting for someone to pay them you know, six months, eight months later. So that there's a whole, um, I guess, in, industry which the, provided by the banks called trade finance. And all they do is they make sure that this, the funds get facilitated. And one of the things is a letter, letter of credit which is actually a physical document. So you sign a document saying, you know, I will pay this upon, you know, proof of shipment, et cetera, et cetera. And there's the buyer's bank and then the seller's bank, you know, involved in that, in that process. And the reason we chose that case study is, um, besides not trying to do a, you know, online shopping example, was one is it has some very interesting features because it's very paper-based today. So you could think about what it mean to, you know, uh, I guess make it more digital. And the second reason was it has nice extensions of going into topics like scalability and Internet of Things because you could say, you know, today it's paper-based, but in the future can we tie the shipments to how containers move around the globe, etc. But, I mean, the case study itself is not that important. What's important is to build such a system, we need to make architectural decisions. That's incredibly, and that is the core part of our, of our ethos. And we gave examples, if you go through the book, our chapters are, after talking a little bit about the principles, we have a chapter on data, security, scalability, et cetera. And we even have emerging technologies, and we gave some examples on machine learning. But the most important thing is, when you say you're architect in the system, you're making a decision. 
that that is it. Nothing else. Nothing more. Right. So it's not drawing diagrams. It's it is really making those decisions. Are actually facilitating the making of those decisions. So I'll try to provide. I think I have three or four examples of the decisions we have, and I'll flash a slight diagram to you. And this is how we decided to structure the system, right? And you know, and what we said is, how many people have read or followed domain-driven design? Okay, that's that's very good. Almost half the audience. So this is kind of uh, and. And there's a, has anyone heard of Vaughn Vernon? He's a guy who, an author who's, okay, one person. So we, actually our book was published as part of a signature series by Vaughn Vernon. So we actually had to kind of put more domain-driven design ideas in the book so it didn't look too embarrassing. But um, I mean, basically the first principle we have is the system's constructs are based on the domain concepts. I mean, and it's kind of a, applying principal power of small, so you can have these loosely coupled components. But it's important that, you know, we're constructing these, these are our, you know, components, and they're constructed around the concepts you have in the domain. So you have a fees and commissions manager, something that does payments, something that manages counterparties, which are the, you know, if you're an exporter, your counterparties are the seller and the banks you deal with. Um, you know, managing documents and contracts, etc. So that was the first big, you know, I mean, we say delay, delay design decisions, but obviously you have to make some design decisions. And that was our first big decision. We said, well, we'll you know, this is how we will construct this thing. You could have constructed the system differently. You could have had one big database and you could have components for each process in the system. So you could have a component that managed the, you know, the creation of the letter of credit. And then you could have another component that managed the payments on that letter of credit. So that was another way you could have architected the system. The, sec the second thing we did was, again, it's a little small, sorry. You know, it was the, <clears throat> is around data. I mean, not the second one, but the second example I'm giving. And what's important is we decided that we will have to follow the micro true microservices thing that each of these components will maintain their own databases, right? So they will be, you know, you, you know independently deployable, deployable and no interdependencies between them. So what we said is that we will define each of the databases, allow the teams to select each database based on their quality attributes and their scalability. So, I mean, it's, it's not that complex a application, so we decided that we'll have, you know, more or less relational databases for most of the components, except the document store will be a document, I mean, doc obviously a document database, not because it's called a document store, because the requirements of how it will evolve align with how a document database should look like. And we had, we have another component, which was also a document store, but that's a component we added later, which is not in this picture. But that was main thing is, and basically two principles we applied there, look at the quality attributes and, um, you know, the team. And skills is quite important while making decisions. Actually, how many people here are or have work on systems that deploy non-SQL databases? So we have about one six of the audience, so not the traditional relational database. And they're getting quite, quite popular for lots of reasons, and some of the reasons is because they're a new fad. But the most important thing there is it should be based on your quality attributes, the decision you're making, and not on anything else. And another key premise is that of any of the architectural decisions you make, selecting your database technology is probably one of the most significant ones because it's something that's very difficult to unwind afterwards. You can change lots of other things, but your database technology, especially if you go with non-SQL, because the benefit of SQL databases is there's a nice segregation of, um, you know, and the database manages a lot of things for you. So in, you do have this object to relational mapping madness, but once you solve that, it's not that difficult. So. But if you go to any other databases, the way you architect your software is quite influenced by your database. So that's another one. So that was our 
second example. The third example is, I mean, we basically said, and this is a good one of delayed design decisions. So we just said all these components will communicate by REST, right? And then if required, and we gave some examples of, of how when that would be required, then you would move to a messaging-based integration between the components. And again, that was not like, let's go, because messaging is more scalable and more performant, but it's more difficult, well, not more performant, actually. It's more scalable, it's, it's but more difficult to implement. You have more di many different moving parts, etc. So we just said, let's start with the rest. And if we find that we don't meet our non-functional requirements, we will move to uh, asynchronous communication. We, we also have this big, fat UI service in the middle of the architecture, and the reason we did that it was a decision we have, which is not here, that we will have you know, native mobile apps. You know, we just decided on that. And that UI service manages that interaction and uh, avoids us to go down something like using like GraphQL, which is a less chatty than REST because that component manages the, the chattiness of the interaction. So that was another decision we made. Uh, finally, a final example is um, more of a resilience example is we decided that the payment gateway, which interacts with the payment service, because our system doesn't do payments, it has to interact with someone else to do payments, that will be installed in a separate virtual machine. So everything else is more traditional, uh, let's say, container-based things, but we have a separate virtual machine for that main reason is for resilience, that thing can go down and it's something that has to be protected, etc. So, it was a very quick run-through of the examples and our idea is not to explain the system to you, but the key message to get across is that's what, when we say when you're architecting a system, that's what we mean, you're making these decisions. You know, that's the most important thing. So I'll come to the final part of the talk, which is really around essential activities. And this is going back to what we really mean by why software architecture. Because we have the principles, they're nice, but so what, right? I mean, it's like, if, you, know, you know, thank you, Murat, but it was great. But, you know, what does it mean day to day? What am I going to do? So we said, what do we mean by if your work, if you're saying I am architect in a system or doing the software architecture, it really means the first thing is your concern is what's running in production, right? Your concern is not anything else. So you are architecting a system, you know, it might seem obvious, but for lots of architects, they, they're, you know, they draw diagrams, they draw boxes and lines, etc. but they should feel accountable for what's running in the production environment. The most important thing is, well, the three or four most important thing is you want to have feedback loops from that production environment. And that's why I liked, I mean, I really liked the Light Run, the only presentation I watched, but the one from Light Run yesterday, because it was a way of showing how a developer can get feedback from the production environment in a, I guess, less intrusive and, I guess, and he called, and it was called observability, but that's important. This whole concept of feedback loops, and feedback loops on everything, like especially the quality attributes, you know, t having test harnesses to be able to run your system and see how it performs under different um, scenarios is quite important, regression tests and all that type of stuff. As we said, the core thing we're doing is an architectural decision, and so if you, and. And how you document them are quite interesting. So I was quite surprised that there are very few people here that are using ADRs, which are, is a concept that's made quite popular by Google, I think. And it's about, and it's a, you know, the techniques for embedding it in Git, and you have a way of being able to document them. And so you document your architectural decisions as close to your code as possible, rather than in a separate repository. So that, that's quite popular, so check them out. What we said is, when you're making your architectural decisions, quality attributes is what drives them the most. And another concept, which hasn't, um, I guess, we have, I haven't spoken about yet, is technical debt. Do, 
I mean, again, another question to the audience: How many people use the concept technical debt in the way in the way they work? Okay, how many people reduce their technical debt over time? I'm I'm quite proud of you. <laughs> no, because I mean, at least where I work, lots of times technical debt, especially for business users, is a great way of avoiding difficult decisions because they say we really want this, and the technologist says no, you can't because. It's going to destroy our architecture, and they say, "Oh, just write it as technical debt, you know." And then you write it as technical debt, and no one comes back. So I'm very—it's it's great that you guys are actually reducing your technical debt over time. But that—that's quite important because they influence your decisions. So when you're making architectural decisions, you prioritize them based on your quality attributes you have to resolve, and the technical debt you have to resolve. So. Basically, like in, in the group that I am accountable for, one thing I did is I don't have a central architecture team or anything. And I just work with, I have about 10 key engineers that I engage with. And the, all I ask from the engineering teams are basically be transparent on your architectural decisions, document your architectural decisions. You know, capture your technical debt so that that's visible and engage with the business that we can reduce it and demonstrate that you are, you know, making these decisions based on quality attributes and nothing else. You don't have to draw any diagrams, you don't have to do anything. That's all we need to do. And that's why we call that the essential activities of software architecture. And the final comment is software architecture is a skill not a role so that's a, a, I, I really believe in that you don't not that the two people who call themselves architects here should feel offended and i call myself an architect as well but it doesn't mean it's something you do naturally as part of software development it's not something that done by someone else it's not um a specific role, it really is a skill, and it should be done just like, you know, we have these um, multifunctional teams where you have DBAs, testers, etc. So architecture is just one of the skills and thing that the team should be doing. It's not something that happens outside of the team, it's what the team does. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Do we sort of all the other?